Okay, very good. <clears throat> um, well, at any rate, uh, I'm I'm just uh, back about a week ago from from my annual pilgrimage to Air Venture, uh, and this is a uh, uh, tonight. It's going to be a slightly modified version of uh, one of the eight talks that I, I gave at Air Venture to uh, happily to standing room only crowds on the forums plaza. Um, this is a fairly long presentation, so I'm going <clears> to <throat> try to get through it as quickly as I can uh, so that we have a little time at the end for, for Q&A. Um, and uh, Tim, I'm just advancing the slide just to make sure that, uh, that everything is working. And it looks to me like it's, it's coming up. Okay, Mike, I see it. It's the next slide titled Lots to Discuss. Good. Um, we had a little problem with the, with the uh, June webinar, a little technical problem, so I wanted to make sure it didn't repeat. At uh, any rate, there's, there's lots of stuff to talk about tonight, and I'm going to try to get through it as quickly as I can. We'll be talking, uh, starting off talking a little bit about the history of engine monitors, the different uh, generations of engine monitors, and the key features that distinguish those generations. Um, I'll then <clears throat> talk a little bit about routine uh, monitoring techniques that, that uh, uh, what I recommend you do um, on every flight uh, using an engine monitor, um, uh, beginning with engine start and, uh, and concluding with uh, uh, descent and landing. Uh, we'll take, go through the flight phase by, fa uh, phase by phase. I'll talk a little bit about how I recommend that you set your alarms. Um, on your engine monitor. Uh, alarms are one of the important features of most engine monitors to, uh, to make sure that, uh, uh, that it gets your attention when uh, something is, uh, is out of tolerance and needs uh, you to look at it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, the flight test profiles that we recommend <coughs> flying uh, in order to capture the most useful data on uh, engine monitors, we, we ask our managed maintenance clients to fly these profiles uh, prior to each annual inspection and any time uh, they uh, suspect that there might be something wrong with the engine or the electrical system or, or whatever so that we can gather as much data as possible in the most efficient fashion. And then I'll spend um, uh, probably half the time tonight uh, talking to you about how we use engine monitors to troubleshoot problems um, and uh, just give you an idea of what the what the process we use uh, uh, to go through a diagnosis by um, um, eliminating uh, various causes that aren't consistent with the data until hopefully we've narrowed the problem down to just one or two possibilities. So let's talk just for a little bit about the history of these things. Um, the very first things that I suppose you could call engine monitors, although they didn't really don't rise to that level, is uh, when uh, Alcor, which is the or original company that, that uh, introduced um, EGT instrumentation for piston aircraft engines back in the, uh, in the 60s, um, came out with an enhancement to their original analog EGT gauge consisting of a rotary switch that would allow you to look at the EGTs on individual cylinders. The original EGT gauges only had a single EGT probe located somewhere in the exhaust cluster, um, but with the advent of this switch, uh, you could install individual EGT probes near the exhaust port of each individual cylinder, and then with the rotary switch, select which of the four or six cylinders uh, you wanted to look at. Pretty crude, but it was the first baby step towards the engine monitors that we have today. Um, a little later on, uh, Alcor and another firm called uh, uh, KSA uh, um, introduced uh, the first multi-cylinder um, EGT uh, instruments where you could actually watch all of the cylinders at once. And again, these were purely analog instruments. They consisted of some uh, 
uh, vertical readout analog gauges that were cleverly stacked up and packaged in a three and an eighth inch uh, instrument package. And uh, in fact, uh, for twin engine airplanes, they even put a switch on there so that you could s select whether you wanted to monitor the left engine or the right engine. Again, these uh, instruments only measured EGT, uh, provided no CHT information, and nowadays we, we know that CHT is really the most important thing to monitor. They had no microprocessors in them. They didn't provide any alarm capability. They didn't log any data. They were just a bunch of analog EGT gauges all stacked up into a single instrument. The very first things that we can properly uh, call engine monitors, although they still were a little bit crude, um, came with the introduction of two instruments, one by uh, Insight, the, the original GEM or graphic engine monitor, which provided a, um, a pseudo analog bar graph uh, using, uh, using an LED display um, and actually provided uh, some microprocessor logic to uh, do things like uh, help you find peak EGT when leaning and so on. And another instrument um, from a company called Electronics International, the US-8, Ultimate Scanner 8, which uh, provided the ability to scan up to 16 channels of, uh, of data, typically all the uh, EGTs and CHTs and a few other inputs, uh, but with a a digital readout uh, where where the absolute value of the of the temperature measurements were displayed on the instrument. Um, uh, both of these instruments uh, had microprocessors in them. They and they had uh, some processing capability. They had uh, some alarming capability, very primitive, but they did not uh, again have any ability to log data uh, into memory and then and then dump it for subsequent analysis. So I, I call these first generation uh, engine monitors um, and uh, they were a pretty big breakthrough uh, and started us down the road to where we are today. Um, then um, <clears throat> in the early 70s, um, a company called JP Instruments, JPI, introduced uh, a device called the EDM 700, which uh, turns out to be the best-selling engine monitor of all time and is in more uh, airplanes than I think probably all other engine monitors combined today. Um, the EDM 700 uh, combined the, um, the bar graph display from the Insight gem with the digital readout of the electronics instrument ultimate scanner and put those all into a single instrument. Um, and for the first time, uh, the EDM 700 also offered the capability of data logging. Originally, it was an option. Later, it became standard equipment. Um, but the instrument was actually able to capture data, uh, log it into memory, and uh, provided a way to, uh, to download that data into a laptop computer and then and then process it and analyze it uh, subsequently. Um, Electronics International quickly responded with a uh, uh, with with a comparable instrument called the UBG16. Uh, JPI um, uh, actually Insight introduced a uh, uh, the first um, engine monitor for twins, the Insight Gemini. JPI quickly responded to that by introducing their own twin engine instrument called the EDM760, which is basically two EDM700s packaged into a single three and an eighth inch instrument. And um, all of these um, all of these various competitive instruments, uh, which I call second generation monitors, had the ability to uh, log data to memory and uh, and download it uh, for subsequent analysis. Um, in recent years, uh, starting about five years ago, we started to see the introduction of much fancier uh, engine monitors um, that I call third generation, uh, distinguished by uh, having high resolution flat panel color displays that uh, allow them to display a whole lot more uh, data uh, with much higher resolution 
um, than, than the old bar graph type LED displays. Uh, many of these were certified for primary instrument replacement uh, so that instead of just being a supplemental instrument, they could actually uh, replace the factory installed engine instruments which was a good thing because some of them are quite large and need a lot of panel space and the only way to get that panel space is to rip some stuff out. Um, <clears throat> these uh, elaborate flat panel displays, these third generation monitors, tend to be quite a bit more expensive than the second generation supplemental instruments. Uh, an EDM 700 can typically be installed uh, for about 3000 uh, bucks, whereas uh, many of these third generation monitors uh, can can run ten thousand dollars or above, but they're very very uh, fancy and very very capable, uh, and a lot of people have been installing them. Uh, and then finally, <coughs> uh, in most new manufacturer aircraft, um, we're seeing um, what I call fourth generation engine monitors, uh, where the engine monitor capability. Uh, is no longer a, a separate instrument, but is uh, is packaged into the uh, aircraft's multifunction display. So uh, this is something that we find in glass cockpit airplanes, where the um, where the engine monitor capability is uh, is part of the MFD rather than being a discrete separate instrument. And this slide is showing both the Avidyne um, offering on the left and the Garmin G1000 on the right. Um, Garmin, for some reason, um, when they introduced the G1000, um, created a quite elaborate engine monitor page on the MFD, but did not um, provide any capability to log or download the data. It was some kind of lawyer thing. Um, and uh, recently, they've uh, started changing that. They started offering um, uh, the ability to uh, <clears throat> to extract the data for analysis originally in the Cirrus SR20 and SR22, uh, then uh, recently in uh, all of the single engine Cessnas that are G1000 equipped. And my understanding is that that uh, on a model by model basis, they're going to be providing enhancements to all of the other G1000 equipped airplanes so that data can be uh, extracted. Um, that change turned out to be uh, a software change only and required no hardware modification, which is a good thing. Okay, so much for the history of engine monitors. Let's talk a little bit about how we, uh, how we use them or how I recommend using them. Um, uh, during the various phases of a routine flight. Um, and we'll start with, uh, with engine start. Um, once you start the engine and, and power up uh, your avionics, including the engine monitor, you want to make sure that all of the cylinders in the engine are, uh, are, are making uh, EGT uh, immediately after engine start. Um, if you discover that that uh, one or or more cylinders don't start firing immediately, which is, will be very clear on the engine monitor because uh, there'll be one or two EGT bars that are missing, uh, and normally uh, is also accompanied with with a, a noticeable engine roughness. That is uh, a, that's the symptom of what we, what mechanics call morning sickness. Um, uh, which uh, indicates that um, a valve is sticking when the engine is cold. Uh, morning sickness is uh, quite common in uh, Lycoming engines and some of the earlier uh, design Continental engines. We don't often see it in the, the later design Continental engines, uh, 360, uh, 470, uh, 520, 550 series engines. Um, because they use a, a, a different uh, valve guide material. But uh, Lycomings and some of the early uh, Continentals, uh, we do see uh, sticking valve uh, problems on a fairly regular basis. And the first um, clue that, that you have a sticking valve problem is normally this morning sickness. Um, if, if you see that, if you see that it takes a while for one or more cylinders to actually start 
combusting and, and generating AGT. It's a condition that you're going to want to follow up on with your mechanic fairly quickly because if you ignore it and uh, allow it to get worse, eventually you can wind up having a, a stuck valve in flight and that can do uh, some serious damage to the engine. So you want to catch it and deal with it early um, and the engine monitor uh, will make it easy to catch that early and, and uh, determine exactly which cylinder is that is involved and then the mechanic can can uh, can check out the valve valves do something called a wobble check and uh, if you have a a, a sticking valve uh, it, that generally can be resolved uh, without removing the cylinder um, from the engine. <clears throat> okay, once we have the engine started and we're taxiing out uh, to the run-up area, uh, I like to perform a preliminary ignition check while I'm taxiing. Um, it's basically uh, the the same the same kind of thing that you normally do during run up except uh, except that that it's simply done at, at at taxi RPM rather than at a higher RPM. Um, so as I'm taxiing out to the run up area, I'll normalize the EGT display, uh, which means that uh, all of the EGT bars um, get centered on the screen at, at the same height, and the um, and the sensitivity of the EGT display is increased. Uh, and then I'll just go through and, and, and cycle the mags, um, uh, the normal both left, both right, both for singles, or just uh, cycle each of the four mag switches in turn for twins. And verify that when you operate, that when you turn off each magneto, uh, you see all of the EGT rise all four or all six depending on how many cylinders you have on your engine and that no EGTs fall or become erratic. Um, <clears throat> if you switch off a mag and you have uh, one or more EGT bars fall instead of rise, um, that's an early warning that you've got uh, some non-firing spark plugs um, and uh, uh, you may just want to uh, uh, skip the run up and, and, and turn around and go back to the shop and have them check it out. Or you may want to, uh, to, to continue to the run up area and investigate um, uh, further. If the preliminary ignition check is normal uh, and I'm in a hurry, sometimes I'll just go ahead and, and skip the normal run up um, and, uh, and just go ahead and take off. Um, if you have time, it's always good to do a a standard run-up, but uh, the taxi out check gives you a, uh, a way of, of, of checking the ignition system early. Um, then once we get to the run-up area, um, we will do a standard ignition check. This time it will be at the uh, normal run-up RPM for the uh, POH for Continentals. Mostly, it's uh, mostly their, uh, the run-up is done at 1,700 RPM, and for Lycomings, typically somewhere between 1,800 and 2,000 RPM, whatever the uh, the ever P, whatever the POH specifies. Um, Lycomings um, um, guidance on on doing run-ups has, has changed about 18 months ago, and um, uh, while your POH uh, probably uh, tells you to do the run-up uh, with the mixture full rich. It's much better to do it um, uh, lean, and that's that's what uh, Lycoming's current guidance is in in their most recent uh, service bulletin. Uh, I always do my my run-ups uh, lean uh, to, to peak RPM. Uh, the procedure for doing the ignition check is the same as we. Uh, discussed for the preliminary taxi check except that it's done at a higher RPM. Again, we normalize the EGT display with, by, by pushing a button on the on the engine monitor to uh, uh, to equalize all the bars at mid-scale and crank up the sensitivity. And then we go ahead and and uh, and run the engine on on uh, in single mag mode on one mag and then the other. And when we uh, operate in single magneto mode. We want to verify that all the EGTs rise, that none of them fall or, or become erratic, and that the engine runs smoothly on each mag individually. Um, the POH uh, calls for, for doing an RPM drop check 
uh, to see how much uh, the RPMs drop on a single mag. Uh, but that's really an archaic test that was uh, that, that was written into the POHs back in the days when we didn't have engine monitors. So if you do have an engine monitor, I, I would I, I would ignore uh, the tachometer completely and focus on the EGT display. Again, the acid test of, of for uh, for an ignition check during run-up is that all the EGT bars rise when you switch off a magneto. None of them fall. Uh, all of them remain stable, and the engine uh, runs smoothly. If it if it meets all those criteria, we really don't care uh, what the RPM drop is. Um, then on on takeoff, um, uh, and this is not really that much of an engine monitor stuff, but it, it just drives me nuts to see how a lot of pilots um, uh, handle their takeoff because they'll they'll jam the throttle all the way forward and and and, um, and do a major insult to the engine. Um, we want to we want to do the takeoff the way the professionals do. Uh, taxi in a position. Um, I normally set the brakes and throttle up slowly to about 50 percent power while holding the brakes, um, scanning the gauges, uh, making sure everything is in the green. Um, in a twin engine airplane, you want to make sure that both engines come up together and there are no ma major splits on any of the any of the dual gauges. Um, ensure that the EGTs are all coming up together and are all somewhere um, in the general ballpark of one another. And then if everything looks good, release the brakes, uh, start rolling down the runway and very slowly throttle up to 100% power. Uh, but move the throttle slowly, warm up the, the cylinder slowly, uh, don't jam in the throttle. It's very, very tough on the equipment and it is not the way to, uh, to, to get good engine longevity. As we're rolling down the runway, we want to, uh, and, and bringing up the throttle slowly to, uh, the throttle to, to 100% power. We want to scan the engine gauges again, make sure everything's in the green. If it's a twin, make sure that there are no splits. Uh, all the EGT bars should be reasonably even and in the right general ballpark um, uh, for high compression engines, um, uh, uh, normally aspirated engines designed to run on 100 low lead. Uh, we normally expect um, EGTs on takeoff, at takeoff power to be somewhere in the 1200s uh, degree Fahrenheit range. Um, the exact value isn't critical, but it needs to be somewhere in the, that ballpark. For lower compression engines certified for, for 80 octane fuel and for turbocharged engines which have a lower compression ratio, uh, we expect the EGTs to be uh, higher than that, uh, typically in the 1300s or so at, at full takeoff power. But that's just kind of a sanity check to make sure that, that, that everything is working. If, if things don't look right uh, aboard the takeoff, we don't want to take problems into the air. Uh, once we break ground and start uh, climbing, um, we want to shift our focus from EGTs to CHTs. And for the balance of the flight, uh, CHTs will be the main thing that, that we worry about. Um, we want to make sure that CHTs are relatively cool for legacy aircraft like the 1979 Cessna 310 that I fly with fairly inefficient cooling systems. Um, we want to keep all of our cylinder head temperatures uh, below 400 degrees Fahrenheit at all times and I prefer uh, to keep them below 380 um, if at all possible just to give a little bit of extra cushion. For recent design aircraft like the, 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 the uh, the Cessna Corvallis or the Cirrus SR-22 or the Diamond DA-40 um, or other recently designed airplanes that have very, very efficient cooling systems. Uh, we want to limit our CHTs even more. Um, for, for that generation of aircraft, I generally recommend um, keeping the CHTs no higher than 380 degrees Fahrenheit and preferably uh, keep them down at 360 or, or less. Uh, those the, 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 those uh, targets that I've just given you um, 
have to be adjusted um, for certain uh, factors like um, during extremely cold weather operation we want to limit the CHTs uh, even more than, than, than that and um, in very high altitude operations typically in turbocharged airplanes when we're up at the flight levels and the air density is very low um, uh, we may have to live with the CHTs a little bit above that uh, so we do need to adjust those targets a little bit for operating conditions um, but those are the general ballpark uh, maximums that, that, that we want to keep CHTs at. If the CHTs get too hot um, we need to do something to bring them down. If you're climbing lower the nose and increase the airspeed. If you have cow flaps, open them to get some more cooling air over the cylinders. Um, if, you're, if you're climbing ridge of peak uh, or cruising ridge of peak and the CHTs get too hot, you want to you want to enrich them to increase fuel flow and, and, and bring the CHTs down. Conversely, if you're um, cruising lean of peak um, and the CHTs get too hot, you'll want to lean some more to reduce fuel flow and, and bring the, uh, uh, the cylinder head temperatures down. Uh, but we want to keep a very close eye on CHTs. Uh, we want to set alarms uh, to make sure that we're alerted to any high CHTs. I'll talk about that in a few slides. And uh, when we see a CHT get too high, we need to do something to bring it down. In cruise, uh, we'll uh, will lean, um, and, and I'm not going to get into leaning procedure here. I, I, I did a, a, a whole w webinar on that called Leaning Basics. It's available on the EAA uh, video site. <clears throat> um, we want to cruise with the EGT display normalized, uh, which cranks up the EGT sensitivity and levels all the bars at mid-scale so that if anything goes wrong with the engine, it will be really obvious. Um, and we want to continue to monitor CHTs and, and, and keep them uh, in, in those uh, zones that we talked about in legacy aircraft, preferably at or below 380 Fahrenheit in uh, modern design aircraft with very efficient uh, cooling systems, um, uh, lower, uh, maybe 360 degrees uh, or so and adjusted, uh, as I said, uh, if necessary for cold weather operation or very high altitude operation. Uh, and again, if the CHTs uh, get too hot, we want to um, rich in if we're rich at peak or lean if we're lean at peak in order to bring the CHTs back down. Um, I like to do an ignition system stress test, which I'll describe uh, a little bit later. Um, uh, on most flights, I typically get in the habit of doing it towards the end of the cruise phase before I start down. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, how to do that, but it's a, it's a uh, it's an in-flight um, mag check that's that's a, a much more discerning test of ignition system condition than anything we could do on the ground. And I like to, to do it every every flight or every few flights just to keep tabs on the condition of my ignition system. Um, when it's time to uh, uh, to start descending as we approach our destination, uh, obviously lower the nose. Um, if you are flying a, uh, a normally aspirated airplane uh, without an altitude compensating fuel system, which is the case of, uh, with most normally aspirated engines, um, as you descend, the mixture is going to get leaner and leaner as uh, the manifold pressure increases and the fuel flow remains the same. So we're going to have to occasionally rich in the mixture manually as we descend. Um, and uh, one good way to do that is to uh, richen it in order to maintain approximately constant exhaust gas temperature in the descent. If you're flying a turbocharged airplane like mine, or if you're flying a, an airplane with an altitude compensating fuel system like uh, the Cirrus SR20 or, or certain Bonanzas that, that are equipped with an altitude compensating fuel pump, um, then the um, mixture change during the descent uh, is, is handled automatically by the equipment so you just have to lower the nose and, and you don't need to touch the mixture all the way down which is very uh, convenient. Um, 
as we're doing our descent, um, and especially when we get to the point where we start reducing power, we want to monitor uh, the cool down rate. Most engine monitors will report cool down rate. And if possible, uh, we want to limit the uh, CHT cool down rate to about uh, 30 degrees Fahrenheit per minute or less. In my experience, it's pretty hard uh, to shop cool cylinders uh, and get above that cool down rate unless you do something very dramatic like yank the throttle way back. As long as you're reducing power fairly slowly, um, um, shock cooling does not seem to be a problem, but the engine monitor uh, will monitor that for you, and if you set an alarm, it will warn you if cool down rate is excessive. It's not nearly as big a problem as, as, uh, as most people uh, tend to think. It's pretty hard to get uh, a cool down rate that's, that's abusive. Let's talk a little bit about the alarm capability uh, of engine monitors. Um, um, most uh, modern engine monitors that are installed as supplementary equipment um, allow you to program uh, the alarm levels for various parameters. Um, some of the engine monitors that, uh, uh, that, were that are installed as primary replacement um, have their alarms hardwired to the manufacturer's red lines, which makes them pretty useless. I mean, the CHT red line for a Lycoming engine is 500 degrees Fahrenheit, and if you get an alarm, don't get an alarm until you get to 500 degrees. That's too late. You've already abused the engine pretty seriously. Um, uh, I was actually talking to the, the, the president, vice president of, of JPI at uh, AirVenture uh, two weeks ago, and they uh, recently received approval from the FAA uh, to uh, enhance their software on their primary replacement instruments to provide two sets of alarms. Um, a, a red alarm that's hard, hardwired to the uh, manufacturer's red lines and what they call a white alarm that is user programmable and that's, that, that's, a, that's a great improvement because uh, unless you can program the alarms, they, they, they really are, are pretty useless. They don't give you a warning in time to do anything about it. Any case, um, here are some alarm settings that I rec would recommend that you use if you're uh, uh, assuming that your uh, engine monitor alarms are user programmable. Uh, the CHT alarm, I set mine at 390 degrees Fahrenheit, um, so I get a little bit of warning before I get to 400 degrees. And um, if you have a, a, a modern design airplane with a very efficient cooling system, you might want to set the CHT alarm as low as, say, 370 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, for oil temperature, um, the ideal oil temperature range is between 180 and 200 degrees Fahrenheit. I set my high temp alarm, uh, oil temp alarm to 210 and the low uh, alarm to 90 degrees. Um, the low uh, alarm is set fairly low because if you don't do that, it'll scream at you uh, pretty much during all ground operations and, and, uh, and then you'll start to ignore it. So um, if you have a turbocharged airplane um, that has a TIT instrumentation, I recommend you set the engine monitor TIT alarm to 50 degrees below the manufacturer's red line. Uh, typically the, the red lines, uh, the TIT red lines on most airplanes are either 1650 or 1750 depending on what kind of turbocharger is installed, and so I would recommend setting the red line, um, I mean setting the alarm about 50 degrees below that. On my airplane, the TIT red line is 1650, and so I set my TIT alarm to go off when the TIT rises above 1600. Uh, some engine monitors will allow you to set an alarm based on the difference between the highest and lowest EGT. If your uh, monitor has that capability, I would recommend setting the alarm at about 150 degrees Fahrenheit for injected engines, possibly 200 degrees Fahrenheit for carbureted engines. Again, we want to set that alarm high enough that we don't get a lot of false alarms uh, because if you do get a lot of false alarms, you just start tuning them out and then when you get a real problem, uh, you may not notice it. Uh, once again, if you do have the ability to alarm on cool-down rate, 
I recommend setting the alarm um, to, to go off when the cool down rate exceeds 30 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. And finally, um, many monitors have the ability to alarm on when the bus voltage, the aircraft bus voltage, uh, either gets too high or too low. Uh, recommended alarm settings for bus voltage, if you have a 28 volt uh, airplane, uh, would be 29 and a half volts on the high side and 25 and a half volts on the low side. Um, if uh, if you have a 14 volt airplane, uh, the, the recommended alarm settings are 15 volts on the high side and 13 volts on the low side. <clears throat> okay, let's talk a little bit about flight test profiles. Um, uh, we have a uh, a write up that we give to uh, uh, our savvy managed maintenance clients, and I've also place that same write-up on the SavvyAnalysis.com site that I'll talk to you about at the end of this webinar. So uh, you can go uh, download um, download the, uh, the flight test profile document uh, from the Savvy Analysis site. Um, and there are, are three tests that we, uh, that we recommend that, that, our, uh, that our clients uh, use uh, uh, or perform to maximize the, the data that's captured by the engine monitor and give us the best chance to, uh, uh, to troubleshoot engine problems. Uh, the first one is uh, a test of the ignition system that we call the ignition system stress test. It's basically an in-flight Lena Peak mag check. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I do this one on almost every flight, and uh, any time uh, that an, any kind of an, uh, an engine anomaly is suspected, and uh, we always ask our, our clients to do this uh, uh, prior to each annual inspection so that we can tell whether, uh, whether there are any, any ignition issues that need to be addressed during the annual. The second test is... Um, a mixture distribution test, otherwise called a GAMI lean test, uh, because it was developed by uh, General Aviation Modifications Inc., the, the GAMI ejector guys. Um, and uh, again, this is a test that we would recommend running every 100 hours or one year uh, prior to each annual inspection to see whether it's necessary to, to, to clean nozzles or to, or to tweak uh, um, uh, fuel nozzles and any time engine anomalies are, are, are suspected. And the last one is an induction leak test, which we normally recommend doing only um, it, when anomalies are, are, are suspected. We don't do that on a, on, a, on a regular basis. So let me just go through those, those flight test profiles briefly, and again, uh, the detailed uh, documentation for them. Uh, can be downloaded from our savvyanalysis.com website. That I'll, I'll give you the URL at the end of the uh, uh, at the end of the uh, of the webinar. Um, we do the ignition um, uh, system stress test in normal lean cruise, uh, preferably aggressively lean of peak. The the leaner you do this test, the more demanding a test it is on the ignition system, simply because lean mixtures are more difficult to ignite than rich mixtures. So the leaner the mixture, the, 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 the better the condition your ignition system will have to be in in order to pass the test, and we really want this test to be as, as discriminating as possible. Um, if your engine monitor allows you to program the sampling rate, uh, we want you to crank it up to the maximum sampling rate that the monitor provides in order to get uh, the, the, as much um, data resolution as possible. Uh, some engine monitors um, have a hardwired sampling rate, and, and some um, allow you to, uh, to program the sampling rate. Uh, normalize the EGT display again by pushing a button that, that levels all the EGT bars in the, uh, at the center of the, uh, of the display. And then go through the, the normal mag check sequence, both left, both right, both for singles, and uh, turn off each um, mag switch in sequence uh, for twins. Um, and you, uh, when you do this test, you want to remain um, on each individual mag for at least 10 sample intervals um, so that we get enough data points to make sense of the data. So if, if your engine monitor is sampling once per second, you want to be on on the single mag for at least 10 seconds. 
on the other hand, if it's sampling uh, once every ten, uh, every six seconds, which is, for example, a default rate for for, for most JPI engine monitors, uh, then you'll want to be um, on one mag for a full minute so that you get ten samples before switching back to both and then and then going to the uh, uh, to the other mag. Um, so when we do this in-flight mag check, we want to, uh, as usual, verify that all the EGT bars rise, that none of them fall, that when they rise, they remain fairly stable at their at their higher values. Normally, EGT will rise somewhere between 50 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit when you turn off a mag. Um, it is fairly normal um, for the odds at cylinders and even cylinders to rise um, more than the than the others. And uh, it's fairly normal for, say, evens to rise when you operate on one mag and odds to rise more when you operate on the other mag. Uh, that's not a problem. That's kind of what we expect to see. And make sure that when you're operating on each uh, mag individually, uh, the engine is running smoothly with, with no unacceptable roughness. I, I use that phraseology because the engine will always run a little rougher on one mag than it does on two. Um, but if it's running rough enough that, that your wife pokes you in the ribs and, and says, what did you do, uh, that's probably too much. So we want to just um, uh, keep an eye out for the engine running um, um, noticeably rough on, on one mag or the other. Here's an example of an of a, a analysis of data dump from, a, from a, uh, uh, an in-flight mag check or, or uh, ignition stress test. Um, you'll notice that um, that the EGTs on the uh, on the right mag look pretty good, uh, but on the left mag, you'll notice that the orange trace, which is uh, EGT number five, is very unstable uh, during the period that you're, we're running only on the left mag. Uh, so it's clear that um, the bottom plug on cylinder number five, which is the one that's connected to the left mag. Um, is is not uh, igniting the mixture reliably, and uh, is is uh, is probably bad. Maybe it has an excessive gap. Maybe its its uh, resistor is has an excessive value. But there's something wrong with that plug, and it either needs to be uh, uh, cleaned and gapped, or maybe it needs to be replaced. Also, notice in this particular um, mag check that the EGTs rose more when we are operating on left mag only than they rose when we were operating on right mag only. Uh, that normally, that, that differential normally indicates that the two mags are not timed uh, the same. On most engines, uh, mag the magneto timing for the left and right mag is supposed to be identical. And if you see uneven rises like this, that normally will indicate that, that the mag timing is split and that the two mags are not firing at exactly the same time. So again, that's something that, that, that you would uh, want to check the timing or have your mechanic check the timing and, uh, and, and bring them right on spec. <clears throat> the mixture distribution test or gammy lean test is normally performed at moderate cruise power, typically 60 or 65 uh, percent. No more than that because we don't want to generate abusive temperatures when we do this test. Um, the airplane should be operating uh, at or near wide open throttle in a normally aspirated airplane. That means climbing up high enough that you can have the throttle all the way in uh, without exceeding 60 or 65 percent power. So it's best to perform it at a relatively high cruise altitude. And again, if the uh, engine monitor has a programmable sam sample rate, we want to crank it up to the maximum sample rate so we get as much data resolution as we possibly can. Um, then starting with the mixture full rich, we want to do a mixture sweep. We want to lean very, very slowly and very, very smoothly uh, until all of the cylinders have passed peak EGT and are uh, well into the Lena Peak area. Um, we normally ask our clients to uh, to lean very, very slowly uh, until the engine gets to the point where it's r running quite rough. So we know all of the cylinders are on the lean side of peak. Um, 
And as you are doing this, if, if your engine monitor records fuel flow, uh, then you don't need to do anything more than, than this mixture sweep because everything's being recorded by the instrument. If your engine monitor does not record fuel flow, then as you perform this mixture sweep, this very slow mixture sweep from full rich to very lean, um, we'll need you to manually record the exact fuel flow at which each individual cylinder reaches peak EGT. Again, if the engine monitor captures fuel flow, you don't need to do it manually because the engine monitor is capturing the data, and that's very convenient. Um, then um, we'll ask you to repeat that procedure several times to make sure that we get uh, uh, several good sweeps. Normally, we will we'll run from full rich to very lean, back to full rich, then to very lean, back to full rich, and do that several times very, very slowly and very, very smoothly. Any, any jerkiness on the mixture control is going to mess up the data pretty badly, so it has to be very slow and very smooth. And um, once we're done gathering the data, then we can ca calculate what's known as the GAMI spread, which is the difference between um, the uh, uh, this slide has a has a uh, uh, has an error on it, but it's basically the difference between the fuel flow on the first cylinder to peak, the the leanest cylinder, and the fuel flow on on the last cylinder to peak, which is the richest cylinder. And let let me illustrate that here with uh, with data that's been been captured. This particular engine monitor did record fuel flow. The fuel flow line is that uh, blue line that descends from left to right. Uh, the other six uh, lines are, are the EGT lines, and you'll notice um, that the very f that as we lean the engine, in other words, reduce the fuel flow from rich to to lean, the very first EGT to reach peak is uh, is the um, cyan uh, trace, which is cylinder number three, uh, which reached uh, peak EGT at a fuel flow of 13.4 gallons an hour. That means number three cylinder is the leanest cylinder, so it, 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 uh, its EGT reached peak first as we were leaning uh, the engine. The next cylinder to peak is number four, which peaks at 13.1 gallons an hour, and the other four cylinders all peak pretty much together at 12.9 gallons an hour, so those four cylinders are the richest of the cylinders number three is a lean outlier um, compared to those other four. And uh, then we, we note the difference in fuel flow between the leanest cylinder, the first one to peak, and the richest cylinder, the last ones to peak, in this case four of them peak together. And we see that the difference in fuel flow is a half a gallon an hour, which is a very respectable GAMI spread. Generally, uh, for engines that, that are operated lean a peak, we want the GAMI spread to be a half a gallon an hour or less. Um, if the uh, GAMI spread is a gallon an hour or more, uh, then the, the mixture distribution is poor and generally speaking the engine will not run very well lean a peak. It, it, it'll start running quite rough when you get on the lean side of peak. And if the GAMI spread is somewhere between um, one gallon an hour and a half a gallon an hour, then it's, it's mediocre. You may be able to live with it, but generally we would try to uh, first clean the injectors, and if that doesn't solve the problem, then tweak the injectors in order to get the uh, the GAMI spread uh, down to a half gallon hour or less. If the engine is carbureted rather than injected, uh, there are several things we can do to improve the GAMI spread, um, notably um, uh, uh, use some partial carb heat, which tends to uh, to improve the mixture distribution. Uh, on carbureted engines. But at any rate, that's the uh, the, the um, mixture distribution test or, or GAMI lean test and, and how it's done. If the engine monitor didn't record fuel flow, then you would have to be recording it by hand. And finally, the induction leak test. Um, we, we set up the airplane in, in cruise at a fairly low altitude uh, with a full rich mixture, and then we run two tests. The first is the high manifold pressure test, uh, which for normally aspirated airplane would be wide open throttle. For turbocharged airplane, um, we would set the throttle so that the manifold pressure is approximately equal to outside ambient pressure. 
um, and then write down the EGT for each cylinder or, or we'll, we'll be able to see it on the engine monitor data if you, if you dump the data. Then we reduce manifold pressure by about 10 inches and then again record the EGTs for each cylinder or, uh, or, or let the engine monitor record them and, and look at them afterwards. And then we calculate the amount of EGT change uh, for each cylinder from the high manifold pressure run to the low manifold pressure run where, where we reduced manifold pressure by about 10 inches. And the deltas should all be about the same for all the cylinders. And if one or two cylinders um, have a much larger, um, or excuse me, a much uh, significantly smaller uh, uh, EGT change than the other ones, uh, that's an indication that we have an induction leak in the vicinity of that cylinder or, or of those cylinders. Uh, so that's the induction leak test. We normally only do this when we suspect that there might be an induction leak. Okay, um, at this point um, I'm going to transition into talking about how we use uh, engine monitor data for troubleshooting and show you a bunch of, of, of problems and, and talk to you a little bit about how we figure out what, what the problems are um, uh, because with a little practice uh, you'll find that uh, that engine monitor data is an astonishingly powerful tool for for diagnosing various engine problems. Um, let me start out with this one. Uh, this is a, a data from a Cessna uh, T210. It was about a four-hour flight and you'll notice um, the number three EGT trace, which is the one that's kind of gray, um, uh, starts going uh, more and more unstable as the flight progresses. Um, and and uh, towards the end of the flight, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite unstable. Now, uh, at first glance, you might think that this is an indication of, of, a, of a failing EGT probe. Uh, or uh, maybe a loose connection on that EGT probe. But if we take a closer look at that uh, unstable area, you'll notice uh, a couple of interesting things. Um, you'll notice that the variation in EGT is very slow and almost perfectly rhythmic. Uh, the EGT went up and down uh, 20 times in 30 minutes. And it went up and down 10 times in the first 15 minutes and 10 times in the second 15 minutes. In other words, this EGT oscillation is extremely uh, regular and extremely rhythmic. And it's very, very slow. It, th these, this is not cycling up and down rapidly like you would expect if you had a loose connection. It, it's cycling up and down a little less than one cycle per minute. Very, very slow and very rhythmic. You'll also notice that the amplitude of the variations is only about 30 degrees uh, Fahrenheit peak to peak. This is on a, a 1500 degree roughly EGT value. So it's a very small percentage change. And it's so small that you'd never notice it on the engine monitor unless the engine monitor were in, uh, in normalized mode where the EGT bars are much more sensitive. So it's in order to be able to detect something like this, it's very important that whenever you're in cruise, uh, you uh, operate the instrument in, in normalized mode. Otherwise, you would never uh, even see a situation like this. You'd never even notice it. Uh, what, uh, what is the cause of these EGT variations? Well, it turns out that there's only one thing and one thing only that can produce slow, rhythmic, variations in EGT with a frequency somewhere around one cycle per minute or so, and that is a burned exhaust valve. And this is the exhaust valve that came out of that Cessna T210. Um, and you'll notice on the left side that, um, that the valve uh, has a very severe hot spot. It's that, that area on, in, in the th roughly the, the 3 o'clock position where the valve was running so hot that ver literally all of the exhaust deposits were burned right off of the, the valve. Um, we could see this very clearly if we looked into that cylinder with a borescope and took a look at the valve. 
Um, in the upper right uh, photo of the valve where we're looking at it uh, in cross-section, you'll notice how badly warped the valve is. And in the lower right part of this uh, photo, again, a different view of the same valve, you'll notice that um, on the right side of the valve, there's a nice shiny ring that is that shows that the valve was in good contact with the valve seat, and the valve seat was was burnishing the 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 the, uh, the back side of the valve and and creating that nice shiny ring. We in a good valve we should see that shiny ring all the way around the circumference of the valve. But on the left side, you'll notice that it's dull, and that there's a tremendous amount of metal erosion. In fact, there's so much metal erosion that that particular edge of the valve has almost gotten uh, to to uh, uh, to a knife-like thinness, and had this valve remained in service very much longer, um, that edge, that knife edge, would 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 break off, and the cylinder would shut down completely, and uh, uh, and you'd be flying a five-cylinder engine and probably declare an emergency. Um, but this is what an exhaust valve, burned exhaust valve, looks like. Um, five or so hours before it would actually fail. And uh, this condition showed up very clearly on the engine monitor uh, if the owner, um, if the pilot knows what to look for, which you now do, and, and keep the engine monitor in normalized mode so that you can see things like this. Again, the unique signature of a burned exhaust valve is a low amplitude EGT oscillation that is very slow and very rhythmic. Typically, the variation is only about 30 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So unless the engine monitor is in normalized mode, you won't notice it in real time. Uh, typically, the oscillation is somewhere in the vicinity of one or two, or two cycles per minute, quite slow. Um, uh, and uh, uh, here's a really interesting example from uh, a, an F33A Bonanza. Uh, a friend of mine, Elliot Schiffman, gave me these these traces from his Bonanza, and it traces the progression of a failing number two exhaust valve over a period of several months. Um, and as you as as you go to the later and later months, you'll see that the oscillation in the EGT on um, cylinder number two, the red trace, becomes increasingly uh, rhythmic and increasing and increasing in amplitude until on the final. Uh, a trace before the cylinder got pulled, um, the, the oscillation was almost uh, a perfect square wave with a frequency of, of literally exactly one cycle per minute, almost as if it came out of a signal generator. It's just amazing. And this is uh, the exhaust valve in its last uh, stages of burning right before the valve would fail. And of course, the uh, Elliot noticed this on his engine monitor, verified it with a bore scope, had the cylinder pulled, and the valve repaired before it actually failed in flight. Uh, what happens uh, if you let things go too far? Well, this is a uh, an actual valve that came out of uh, my own Cessna 310 about 20 years ago, back in the bad old days before we had engine monitors and before we used bore scopes. And where these this kind of failure was relatively routine, and as you can see, uh, a, a piece a chunk broke off of the valve, and and the, the cylinder shut down. This is the sort of thing that was fairly common 20 years ago, but today there's really no excuse for it happening um, because we we have the technology to detect it uh, well before failure, both uh, through bore scope inspection, which typically gives you 100 hours or more warning before failure, and the engine monitor uh, readouts, which if you know what you're looking for, will give you a heads up 20 or 25 hours before the, the valve actually gets to the point of failing. Uh, this, this next series uh, of, um, of engine monitor data uh, illustrates uh, probably the most dramatically violent and destructive thing that can happen to an aircraft engine, and that's a pre-ignition event. This particular one happened in an SR, a Cirrus SR20 that uh, that my company manages uh, fairly, uh, and, and it occurred just this last January. Uh, the uh, 
the pilot had flown the airplane up to Santa Barbara for a hundred dollar hamburger it turned out to be one of the most expensive hamburgers of his aviation career by the time it was over uh, when he took off out of Santa Barbara to head back for home um, he got a, uh, a CHT alarm a high CHT alarm on his engine monitor and felt a little uh, roughness and very wisely decided to quickly throttle back declare an emergency to Santa Barbara Tower and put the airplane back on the ground promptly which was was quite a good thing if you take a look at this engine monitor data it's very dramatic um, uh, he applies takeoff power all of the CHTs which are the upper graph um, th th these graphs by the way are, are from our savvy analysis uh, uh, dot com site that I'll talk to you about at the end of the, of the webinar but you'll see that all of the CHTs started to come up together and then very suddenly uh, the CHT in cylinder number three um, uh, started running away uh, very very rapidly it rose um, from 374 degrees which is a normal uh, CHT on takeoff all the way up to 653 degrees which is the hottest CHT I think I've ever seen recorded on any airplane and it did it in a period of less than two minutes it happened very very quickly um, at, at, uh, at, at that point uh, uh, the pilot uh, throttled by, back aggressively um, but not quite in time uh, to, to save that cylinder I'll, I'll show you that later uh, when my uh, account manager uh, first looked at this data he, he uh, sent me an email asked me to look at it and said um, I'm having a hard time believing that this is real data because I've never seen a CHT uh, of 653 degrees I didn't even think that was possible and I'll have to admit it was the highest CHT I'd ever seen recorded as well but when I took a look at the data it was very obvious that this this data was real it was not an instrumentation problem and the way you could immediately tell it was real is that it was confirmed uh, by a big anomaly in the EGT of cylinder number three so it couldn't just be a problem with a bad uh, CHT probe or a bad connection or something like that we, we I knew immediately that it was real um, we uh, we told the shop to uh, uh, to pull the airplane in and uh, do a bore scope inspection of cylinder number three and I told the shop to expect that uh, that 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 the piston in cylinder number three was probably melted and in fact uh, the piston was severely melted around about two-thirds of its circumference uh, the the number one compression ring was was compromised and pretty much welded into place it was a it was a real a real mess fortunately the damage was limited to the number uh, to, to that particular piston and cylinder and uh, although there was a tremendous amount of aluminum in the oil filter from the melted piston we were able to verify that the filter caught all the metal and we were able to just replace the piston and cylinder um, and uh, and not have to tear down the engine so the fact that the uh, the pilot pulled up pulled the uh, uh, power back uh, quickly was uh, really helped uh, save the engine here's another uh, one in, an, in another SR-20 this one was actually an, an airplane in England and it was a, it was sort of interesting again it happened on takeoff in this case it was cylinder number five that, that had a thermal runaway um, the CHT got up to 500 degrees and then flat topped and the reason it flat topped was not that it really did that but this particular Cirrus had an Avidyne um, MFD with the engine monitor function in it and for reasons known only to Avidyne, their software uh, doesn't register CHTs above 500 degrees. It, it, it assumes that that's as high as it can get. Um, we're guessing that the CHT actually got up to somewhere above 600 degrees, but the engine monitor didn't record the actual temperature uh, just because of a software issue uh, with the Avidyne software. Uh, again, from the time that the CHT, uh, that number five CHT, uh, got over 400 degrees Fahrenheit, to the time that it peaked and actually melted the piston, um, was less than two minutes. Uh, 
the CHT again rose at, at, a, at a very rapid rate of more than one degree per second. Um, here's another uh, uh, similar uh, runaway. This one is, is quite complicated uh, to, to look at. It, it came out of a, a bonanza, uh, but again, CHT5 ran away shortly after takeoff until it melted a hole in the piston. Um, this one rose so rapidly that uh, uh, that the piston was destroyed in le in, a, in about one minute after uh, after the CHT uh, reached 400 degrees, and that was uh, that was the result. This this engine um, was was trashed and had to be torn down. <clears throat> so the, the moral of the story on on these violent events. Uh, we want to set the CHT alarm at no higher than 400 degrees. Um, I set mine, as I mentioned, at 390. And if the CHT exceeds 400, you want to act immediately to prevent it from going any higher. Um, and if it continues to rise rapidly and reaches 420 degrees, you want to throttle back to idle immediately to break the run to to break the runaway because you want to stop this. Uh, phenomenon be, before uh, before something melts, and uh, then once you've once you've broken the the thermal runaway and the CHT start to come down, then bring in just enough power to keep the airplane aloft and uh, put the airplane down at the very next airport and pull the top spark plug, stick a boroscope in the cylinder to see whether uh, whether there's damage to the piston or the combustion chamber. But these are very violent events. They happen very rapidly, and you have to respond to them almost immediately. You, you have maybe 30 seconds to respond to this sort of thermal runaway uh, in order to prevent damage to the engine. And if you don't respond very rapidly and, and have an alarm that, that gets your attention immediately, um, you, you're going to at least lose the cylinder and very likely lose the whole engine. Um, <clears throat> Finally, I'm going to uh, uh, take you through a couple of uh, a, a couple of uh, diagnosis situations uh, to illustrate the, the way we we do what's called a differential diagnosis by uh, by systematically eliminating possibilities and, and until we've we've narrowed the, uh, the the cause of a problem down. And I'll just show you a couple of examples very very quickly to illustrate uh, uh, kind of the way this. That this works. I'll start off with um, with this one that de depicts about one minute of uh, of engine operation. Uh, the particular minute that it illustrates is the point where <clears throat> the pilot um, uh, leveled off in cruise and decided to do what we call a big mixture pull to transition from a rich of peak climb mixture to a lean of peak cruise mixture, something he had done many many times before uneventfully. In this case, when he pulled back the mixture to lean a peak. Um, <clears throat> the engine started running rough and two of the EG two of the six EGTs, cylinders number two and four, started dropping rapidly. It was pretty obvious that those two cylinders um, had stopped uh, producing power. Um, he richened the mixture a bit and the the two cylinders came back. Uh, so at the end of the flight he captured the data. And, uh, and sent it to me uh, to see if I could figure out what was wrong. Um, so how do you figure out what's, what's wrong uh, in a situation like this? Well, you, you figure it out by the process of, elimin uh, of elimination. Uh, it takes three things for a cylinder to produce combustion, fuel, air, and spark. Um, air is typically never a problem uh, when only one or two cylinders are uh, affected because Almost anything that would prevent air from getting into the engine would prevent air from getting to all the cylinders at once. So typically, um, we need to figure out whether this is a fuel problem or an ignition problem. Now, um, so uh, it, it, it's possible that, that, that cylinders two and four started to flame out because they were running leaner than the other cylinders, or it's possible that they started to flame out because there was a problem with their spark plugs or, or, or something that, that caused an ignition problem. Again, remembering that it's much harder to ignite a, a lean mixture than it is a rich mixture. So if there's a marginal ignition problem, uh, 
it's going to show up with a lean mixture and it might look fine with a rich mixture. So how do we figure out which one that is? Well, this one's fairly easy. If we take a look at the what the EGTs did when he did that big mixture pull from richer peak to leaner peak, uh, we can see that all six cylinders reached peak EGT at just about the same time, which uh, suggests that all of the cylinders uh, were running roughly the same mixture. If two and four were running leaner than the other cylinders, then they would have reached peak before the other cylinders, and it appears that's not happening. So if we uh, igni if we can um, eliminate a, a fuel problem like a, like a clogged injector or something by the process of elimination, this needs to be uh, an ignition problem. And so in fact, um, I told the owner that it looked like an ignition problem, and he needed to check the spark plugs uh, in cylinders two and four. Um, he he actually had those spark plugs replaced, and the problem went away. Uh, it would have been better had he reacted to this anomaly in flight by doing um, an ignition stress test, a, 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 an in-flight Lena Peak mag check, because that would have verified that it was an ignition problem and would have probably let us know whether it was the top or bottom spark plug uh, that was the culprit. Uh, but he didn't do that at any rate. We, we figured out that it had to be an ignition problem uh, simply because um, all of the symptoms indicated that the, that fuel was was fine. Here's another more complicated scenario. Um, this is about 20 minutes of of uh, of a flight. Again, um, it starts where the pilot levels off in cruise and transitions from richer peak to leaner peak. Everything looks fine at first, um, but over the, the the succeeding seven or eight minutes. The uh, EGT uh, for the number five cylinder, the orange trace, starts creeping higher and higher, and the purple trace, which is the turbine inlet temperature, uh, creeps up along with it. Eventually, the pilot notices this, uh, sort of panics and shoves the mixture control full rich. Of course, all of the EGTs come crashing down when he does that. Then he decides that that was a little bit of an overreaction, so he leans a little bit to a reasonable rich a peak cruise mixture. Everything seems fine. And then later he, he leans back to a, a lean a peak mixture. Everything still looks, uh, looks okay to him. But he was sufficiently unnerved by this experience that, that he dumped the data and, uh, and sent it in uh, to be analyzed to figure out what was wrong. Now this was a, a fairly complicated and fairly unusual case. Uh, so, you know, I looked at it to try to get some sort of a clue as what could be wrong. <clears throat> and, and again, we're trying to figure out, is this an ignition problem? Is this a fuel problem? What's, what, what caused this anomaly? Well, the first thing I noticed was that during that seven or eight minutes where the number five uh, EGT was climbing higher and higher, the number five CHT was moving lower and lower. Um, so the two were, the CHT and EGT were moving in opposite directions. Uh, all of the other uh, EGTs and CHTs were relatively constant. Um, I know uh, from experience, and, and this is a basic rule of thumb, that any time we see EGT rise and CHT fall, that is almost always indicative of an ignition system problem, of a, of a spark plug that's not firing. Again, it would have been good if the if the pilot uh, confirmed this with an ignition stress test. He could figure out exactly which spark plug was was non-firing, but he didn't do that. In any case, uh, I indicated to him that one of the spark plugs in number five was was bad and needed to be replaced. Again, a general rule of thumb that really helps a lot when we're doing this sort of diagnosis: that if we have a fuel-related problem. Um, say a, a, an injector that's clogging up or something like that. Uh, Fuel-related problems almost always cause CHT and EGT to move in the same direction. They might m both move up, they might both move down, depending on whether you're operating rich of peak or lean of peak at the time that the problem occurs. But they virtually always move in the same direction. On the other hand, if we have an ignition-related problem, that almost always causes 
EGT to rise and CHT to fall. So that's a real easy rule of thumb that frequently helps us distinguish between fuel-related problems and ignition-related problems. But as I was looking at this same data, I noticed something else kind of interesting. And, and, and that was that this number 5 CHT was sometimes the highest CHT of all six cylinders, and at other times, it was the lowest CHT of all the cylinders. That's kind of unusual because, generally speaking, the, the rank of the cylinder CHTs tends to remain pretty constant. The hottest cylinder is usually the hottest, and the coolest is usually the coolest. In this case, the, all of the ranks remain pretty much the same except for number five, and number five kept trading positions between being the hottest and being the coolest. And if you look at it, you'll notice that what the pattern is. Anytime um, the pilot was operating this engine rich a peak, the number five CHT was the hottest. Anytime he was running lean a peak, the number five CHT was the coolest. Well, that um, clearly indicates that the number five cylinder most likely is running leaner than the other cylinders. Um, when rich a peak, it's, a, it's leaner, so the CHT is hotter. When lean a peak, it's leaner than the other cylinders, so, so the CHT is cooler because, um, because the, at, at the leaner mixture, the cylinder is producing less power. Now, how can we verify that diagnosis? Well, we can take a look, as we did before, at the point where the pilot transitioned from richer peak to leaner peak. And if we blow that up, we can see very clearly that cylinder number five peaked well before the other five cylinders. So cylinder number five is running considerably leaner than the rest of the cylinders. So either the number five fuel nozzle is dirty or the number five fuel nozzle is the wrong size. So I recommended to the owner that he have number five fuel nozzle cleaned and, uh, and do a, a, a lean test. And if uh, the number five cylinder was still leaner than the others after cleaning the nozzle, that he needed to install one larger size nozzle in the number five position to get its mixture in line with the other five. Again, as a general rule of thumb, if the CHT rank of a cylinder changes between rich of peak and lean of peak, that usually indicates a mixture imbalance. And we can confirm that uh, by doing a gamelene test. Um, if a cylinder has is the hottest when operating rena, a rich a peak, and coolest when operating lean a peak, um, th then 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 that cylinder is running too lean. On the other hand, if a cylinder has the is is hottest all the time, both when rich a peak and lean a peak, then there's normally a cooling air issue, and we need to inspect the baffles. Um, and if all cylinders have excessive uh, cylinder head temperature, um, we would suspect that the uh, ignition timing is advanced because advanced ignition timing will cause all cylinders to have high CHT and all cylinders to have low EGT. Um, so again, from the engine monitor data, we can easily um, determine what the cause of the problem is. Here, here's a situation where um, where the number three EGT suddenly rose by about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and the number three CHT um, became lower than the other cylinders, and then all of a sudden, all by itself, the situation corrected itself. Uh, the number three EGT went back down to normal, and the number three CHT went back up. Uh, again, uh, we've got EGT and CHT moving in opposite directions. So it indicates a non-firing spark plug. In this particular case, the spark plug was fouled, and then it spontaneously um, got, got unfouled, which is a fairly common occurrence. And we see that sort of thing all the time. Here's a, a case where we uh, are seeing a number one CHT with all kinds of noise on it. Um, if we look closer, we'll see that that noise is not slow and rhythmic. It's, it's rapid and random. Um, and this is an indication of either a failing probe or a bad connection. CHT cannot 
rise and fall rapidly the way uh, EGT can. The cylinder head has a lot of thermal mass. CHT changes quite slowly. Um, so if you see CHT changing rapidly like this, that violates the laws of physics and it can't possibly be true. It has to be an indication problem. Again, if an engine monitor, uh, if engine monitor data appears to defy the laws of physics, it's probably not real. It's probably an instrumentation issue. Uh, here's a case with EGTs that are showing spikes in the downward direction. CHT looks normal, so we're pretty sure that these spikes aren't real. If we look at them more closely, uh, they're quite random. There's nothing rhythmic about them, uh, and we can conclude that this is a problem with the number three EGT probe or possibly a bad connection at the number three EGT probe where it connects to the harness. Um, here, here's a, a funny one where on, on takeoff EGTs suddenly shoot up way too high. They're way up over 1600 degrees Fahrenheit, which we don't want, and then suddenly return to normal. If we take a look at the fuel flow and this engine monitor recorded fuel flow, we'll discover that the initial fuel flow on takeoff was way too low and then suddenly it went up 10 gallons an hour to 29 gallons an hour which is about normal for this engine and then subsequently <coughs> the pilot um, reduced power and leaned and it went back down to 12 gallons an hour which is normal for Lena P. Cruz. What happened? The pilot uh, took off and forgot to push the mixture in and then he realized his error and shoved it in and that's when the fuel flow suddenly jumped up by 10 gallons an hour and the EGTs went back to what they ought to be. And finally, this one is, is really interesting. This is again from my friend Elliot Schiffman's uh, Bonanza F-33A where he <coughs> ran a test flight uh, where for the first, uh, I think, eight minutes or so of the flight, he was running uh, the engine at 27 inches of manifold pressure and 2100 RPM Lena Peak and then he transitioned um, to 21 inches of manifold pressure and 2500 RPM. The first setting was um, I guess what many people would call way over square and the second one was way under square. Um, because the fuel flow was exactly the same for both, uh, uh, both segments of the flight, we know that the engine was putting out exactly the same amount of power. It was consuming exactly the same amount of avgas with exactly the same number of latent BTUs uh, per hour. But look at the difference in the CHTs and EGTs. Um, the, uh, uh, the CHTs are about 50 degrees higher in the second part of the run. The EGTs are about 100 degrees higher in the second part of the run. Why would that be? Well, it, 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 it's that, that's the case because operating at high manifold pressure, low RPM is always much more efficient uh, than doing it the other way around. Um, the, uh, the CHTs are higher with the high RPM operation because friction varies with the square of RPM and so it, at 2500 RPM the, the friction is uh, something like 30 some odd percent greater than at 2100 RPM and the EGT was higher because at the higher RPM uh, there's less time between the time the spark plug fires and the time that the exhaust valve opens and so a lot of the combustion event actually just gets wasted out the back door uh, and yet doesn't get turned into, uh, in, in, into useful uh, uh, mechanical energy turning the prop and creating airspeed. So the moral of this story, and I, and I talk about this in the leaning webinar as well, is that whenever you have the choice, always use maximum M manifold pressure and minimum RPM rather than the other way around. This is probably the exact opposite of what your flight instructor taught you, uh, but it's the best way to, to run the engines, and it's the way I always run my engine uh, engines, and, and, and mine are at 200 and some odd percent of TBOs. So obviously I'm not hurting anything. Uh, just to conclude, uh, engine monitors are an amazingly um, uh, powerful way of, of diagnosing engine problems. Uh, 
suggest that, that you dump your engine monitor data before every annual inspection and any time you suspect any kind of an engine anomaly, um, certainly before permitting any mechanic to, to uh, ex uh, perform exploratory surgery on your engine like pull cylinders. Uh, we don't want to diagnose engines through surgery. We want to diagnose them through data analysis. Uh, we, we, we want radiologists, not surgeons, uh, to be doing our diagnosis. Um, if, if, you, uh, if you can uh, can figure out what's wrong yourself, that's great. It takes a little practice. Our Savvy Analysis site has uh, the most powerful tools uh, available for, for analyzing uh, this data, and it handles data from virtually every brand of engine monitor ever built. Uh, it's a free site. We encourage you to use it to upload your data there and to use all the neat tools for analyzing the data. And if you can't figure out what the data is trying to tell you, then have somebody who uh, has some expertise in this area uh, take a look at it. Um, <clears throat> the SavvyAnalysis.com uh, site went on stream um, uh, just before the 1st of July. Uh, I announced it uh, at uh, at AirVenture in all my um, talks on the forums plaza. Um, it's a free site. We encourage you to use it. It's the most powerful data analysis platform that's ever been created. It's completely web-based, so it'll run on anything that has a browser, Macs, PCs, iPads, whatever. Um, and uh, and if you go to the website, um, you, you can just create a free account uh, by just giving your, your name and email address and the password you want to use. And then you can log into the site, upload your, your engine monitor data analysis or engine monitor data that you download from your uh, engine monitor and use all these neat tools uh, to, to analyze it. There's a whole bunch of documentation on the site. There's the flight test profiles, all sorts of, there, there's instructions for how to, download engine monitor data from, from many different kinds of engine monitors, all sorts of great stuff if you're interested in engine monitor data analysis uh, to be had at this site. And once again, it's free. Now, it's, uh, beginning sometime in September, <clears throat> we will uh, be starting to offer um, professional analysis services if, if you want somebody uh, to take a look at the data uh, it'll be done on an annual subscription basis. The professional analysis, of course, won't, won't be free, but it'll be very modestly priced. Uh, but but the platform and all the tools and stuff are are free and will continue to be free forever. No ads, no gimmicks. It's uh, we just want people to start using um, engine monitor uh, data analysis instead of letting mechanics tear engines apart. And with that, uh, Tim, and I'm sorry this, this ran a little bit long, but, uh, but it was a long presentation. Um, if, if we have a little time, I'd like to go ahead and open it up, uh, up for questions. I'll leave my contact information here on the screen, so if there are any questions that we don't get to um, during this session, um, feel free to, uh, uh, to email me, and, and I'll try to answer every question. Um, and uh, there are several URLs, including the one for the, the, the Savvy Analysis site. Great, Mike. Thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation, very informative. Uh, thank you for your, your time and sharing that uh, knowledge and information you have about engine monitors. Uh, we have gone uh, 10 minutes over our allotted time, so we won't be able to take uh, questions tonight. Uh, but uh, as you said, uh, anybody that would like to contact you will have uh, your email contact up on that uh, screen page right there. So with that, uh, Mike, I'd like to thank you again for your participation tonight. Uh, very informative as always. And for everyone in the audience, thank you so much for attending. And I uh, hope to have you tune into another EAA webinar sometime in the future. Thanks, everyone, and have a good night. Thanks, everybody.